For our listeners who don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Will Christou, and I'm the new Arabs correspondent here in Beirut. Will, I understand you have a story for us. Boy, do I. Yeah. So over the past few years, Lebanon has lurched from crisis to crisis. We've had corruption, economic collapse, a cast of nefarious villains, revolutionary heroes, explosions, love, loss, tragedy, hope and despair. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about that today. You've got it all then? We have. Well, why don't you say the next bit? Sure. My name is Will Christou, and welcome to the New Arab Voice. So we start in the prequel to our story in the early part of the 2010s. Lebanon seems to be doing fairly well. Life was seen to be improving. The country had developed a thriving middle class that gave the appearance of stability. Tourism was returning. And as the IMF said in the 2010 report, the economy was performing remarkably well. Still, the country had its fair share of challenges. Syria's civil war brought over 1.5 million refugees to Lebanon. A trash crisis ground Beirut to a standstill in 2015. Poverty was endemic to many parts of the country. Nonetheless, the country held. Better than some expected. And in 2016, Lebanon finally managed to break its political deadlock and elect the 83-year-old Michel Aoun as president. The national currency, the Lebanese lira, was trading at 1500 per dollar, a price it had held since its value had been pegged to the dollar back in the 1990s. If you fast forward a bit to maybe 2016, 17, 18, even though politics is unhealthy, there's a sense of relief that a government was formed, that there was a president in power, despite his popularity or an unpopularity. This is Rani Shatta. He's as ingrained in Lebanon as you get. I host a podcast called The Beirut Banyan. When things are slightly calmer, I give a walking tour in Beirut called Walk Beirut, and I write for various outlets, including Now Lebanon and on occasion Lorient Le Jour. Though mostly calm on the surface, the country's systemic issues were coming to a head. And things felt tentative always, I think, but no one expected, no one anticipated a dramatic freefall in terms of economic collapse. I think you can forecast many things and you could say that Lebanon's economy was not sustainable, but I think the the downward spiral, I don't think anyone saw that happening. Anticipated or not, the freefall was coming. The image of growth, the shining metal and glass buildings erected on the battlegrounds of the Civil War, the banking system that prided itself on being the jewel in the crown and earned Lebanon the moniker of the Switzerland of the Middle East. All of that turned out to be a lie. And like all lies, the truth eventually came out. Cut to October 2019, and one event after another is compounding people's anger. At the start of the month, importers started to complain about a shortage of dollars in the country. Strikes were being called for by the bakeries and petrol station unions. On the 14th of October, devastating wildfires began to spread in the west of the country. Lebanese citizens were outraged to find that their fire service had not been sufficiently funded and their vehicles not properly maintained. The state's riot trucks, equipped with water cannons, on the other hand, had been properly funded. And on October 17th, desperate to raise funds and fill the holes left in the state's coffers, the government announced a host of new taxes. Tobacco and petrol were to go up, but also announced was a new monthly tax for using WhatsApp. The response from the protesters was Thaura, Arabic for revolution. The first hours were, they could be scary, because the first hours, after 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10, nobody, I think, really understood what was happening in the first hours, because there was fire, there were clashes, there was violence, that quickly turned into a national movement overnight, into something that was quite beautiful, I think is, is a victory in itself. October 18, 1920, leading up to the Prime Minister's resignation, um, I think that stretch, there was a tentative, tentative uh, feeling that enough Lebanese from different political camps were going to put their local issues on the back burner and update the system, reform it once and for all. And the crowd that governed this country in the post-Civil War years, the ones that failed, 
but were still in power, whether by individual merit or whether under pressure, doesn't matter, they were all going to be part of history. There was a feeling that, that could be just a few days, if not a week, but I don't think it lasted longer than that. On October 18th, then Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri made an announcement. Either our partners in the coalition government give a precise and final answer that convinces me, the Lebanese people, the international community and all those expressing anger on the streets today that there will be a decision from everyone to begin reform and to stop government waste and corruption or I will have a different message to share. There will be a very short time limit and this should be clear for everybody. And if you're wondering how long is this short time limit, it's 72 hours. The clock started ticking and protesters showed no signs of letting up. Five and a half thousand miles away in New York City, USA, Fatin Jibai was watching events unfold. I was uh, touring in New York, actually. It was, um, I was a tourist there and I uh, saw on Facebook incredible images and videos that I never thought I'd ever see. Fatin is a Lebanese journalist and media trainer. Of course, since 2015, we've seen people on the streets, but this was the first time that we see this enormous amount of people on the streets. And I don't know, I had those heartbeats, the, this rush of adrenaline. And I remember I was with my cousin there. I stopped touring. And whenever she wants to see a museum, something like I was in the Metropolitan Museum, for example, uh, and my, my cousin is just happy seeing everything around. I was like just using my phone to know what's happening there. So this was literally the first time ever in my life as Lebanese that I felt that something huge, something nice, something like incredible happening back in my country. Three days later, Fatin was on a plane heading back to Beirut. My sister picked me up from the airport and rather than going home and washing up after a very long trip, I, I went directly to the streets and... And okay, this might sound cliche, but I cried <laughs> and it was very, very emotional. This was the first time that I see this much of Lebanese flags, this much of diversity on the streets. And I felt it's huge. All the people present here are suffering. All of them have a deep wound in their hearts. The good thing here is that sectarianism has disappeared. Lebanon's leaders were not able to accomplish that. They did the opposite and encouraged sectarianism. At these protests, the leaders were able to unite us together. After years of a political system governed by sectarianism, protesters in those early days spoke of a genuine sense of unity. And for a brief moment, there was a hope that the divisions between groups that have kept Lebanese society divided since before the civil war could be ended. But I remember as a journalist, I wasn't covering, but I was like very curious. So I sat with a lot of people I, and I talked to a lot of people. And I start, started realizing when talking to people in tents and, and et cetera, um, that many, many of them were um, like, they belonged to political parties. And many of them, from different political parties were already telling me like, yeah, um, I'm here from Kata'ib, for example, but I believe that Kata'ib is part of the protest. Then I would go to uh, Hezbollah and the, the same thing. So I started realizing, okay, maybe I was a, a little bit dreamy when I thought that, oh, we're out of all of this. <laughs> it was childish to think so. Yeah, but I, I saw it. Like, uh, like I, I felt like a little bit childish when I was dreaming this big. Political parties like the Christian Lebanese Forces or the Shia group Hezbollah have for years built their authority on sectarianism. It's a political system created by the French and cemented during the horrors of the Lebanese Civil War, when religious groups were pitted against each other. Political leaders in Lebanon have used sectarianism as a tool to maintain power for years, feeding off of a perceived threat from a rival group and presenting themselves as the defender. The system in detail is incredibly complex, but at its heart is a simple way to divide the power and resources of the country. The New Arab's international editor, Yezin Saadi, can explain it better than I can. The structure of power in Lebanon is separated by sect. It's a sectarian system, where certain positions are predetermined by one's religion. And those spaces are filled by certain political parties, which are linked to traditional history and traditional elites. And there is dynastic roles in these parties, where the father's role passes on to the son or daughter. So there is a hereditary aspect. It kind of is an extension of Lebanese history 
before with, you know, uh, fiefdoms, right? It's a modern form of fiefdom interplayed with political party garments. So that's kind of the system in Lebanon. And all these elites have, you know, their backers, their patrons, whether regionally or internationally. The message was a simple but effective one. You may not like us, but stand against us and you'll find the alternative is far worse. We are here to take the government down and say to all governors who are present that they have to come down. The Arab people are demonstrating. Do not think they are the same as they were in the past. And I think the first day was quite interesting for people uh, because it was very surreal. The first days it was like a million or above a million people on the ground, which is the largest uh, mobilization that Lebanon has seen in a long, long time. So it was very euphoric. There was a lot of potentiality. Things were happening on the ground. Groups were being formed. Tactics were being suggested. It was a universe of possibilities, I think, the early period. And I think that's the best period because anything can happen. And people are willing to take risks because anything can happen. For a few days in October 2019, there were hopes that Lebanon's old ways of governing could be changed and that a new way of politics could be forged. The hope was short-lived, however. Fatin witnessed it firsthand, watching sectarian leaders create divisions before her eyes. Her first sign that this period of utopian hope was coming to an end was a speech by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. The situation in Lebanon now has entered an area of regional and international political targeting using internal elements. The issue is no longer related to a popular movement, peaceful protests, health, environment, job opportunities, hunger and corruption. I am speaking to the audience of the resistance clearly and honestly. We are not concerned and we don't have an interest in being present in these squares. On the contrary, It is within our interest to stay away from them and follow up. If there are positive things happening, we build on them for the benefit of the whole country. But if there are mistakes, we monitor, judge and follow up. I think it was when Hassan Nasrallah announced that this protest doesn't resemble what uh, the Shi'i want and things like that. Because I come come from the Shi'i community and I have a lot of friends that we we, we don't get along in our political views, but we saw each other there and we went together on the streets. And then like I went with my friend Mariam, for example, and then the next day I was texting her, do you want to go back to the streets? And she was like, no, we shouldn't anymore. And like it comes from personal experience. Maybe people from different environments had it differently, but th- this hit me hard that, okay, that was it. Like the dream is over now. After initially being knocked back by the scale of the protests and the intense anger directed at the political parties, the politicians began to push back. Cracks in the revolutionary movement began to show. Whether it was the counter-revolution of the political parties who have had a history, a long history and knowledge of how to create divide and rule amongst themselves or reassert their power, whether through using physical violence or their media or propaganda, vilification of another community, all that stuff, as well as, you know, the hesitancy of, you know, certain opposition figures to talk about, you know, uh, anti-sectarian tactics or identities. And Ronnie Shatta. Because sectarian I think has become a loaded term over time and it's become a pejorative term over time. But I don't think it is. I think it's a supermarket term. And you can pick and choose what you want from this word at any given point. It's a description. It's a description of how Lebanese organize themselves in ways that are not... uh, An independent MP could want it to be different, but it won't be different. And I think that is perhaps why these kinds of newer ideas They're not able to flourish, they're not able to expand, because the basics of reform have not happened. What they're campaigning for, I think, is in a Lebanon where a Senate would have already been established, where political violence would be part of our past, and we've had a generation or two or three to reform sectarianism to the point that it's becoming secular. They jumped. I think they went uh, and assumed that sectarian is bad and you have to get rid of it, and that's that. That's not, I think, the Lebanese experience. 
And I think sectarianism could even be a good word if you want it to, if it's working. So for me, the Senate, which is in the Constitution, is, I think, a positive attribution to sectarianism. It's communal anxiety in a proper location, not through war, not even through uh, bad elections. It's in a mosaic that's preserved in a chamber. I would celebrate that, but that's sectarian. Being too secular, I think, as an independent may not resonate enough right now. You have to go through reform to get there. At the same time, those who spoke about secularism often were quite obnoxious about it, <laughs> so that didn't help matters as well. What do you mean obnoxious about it? I mean the way they presented it as the be-all and end-all solution. Yes, having a, sec a secular system is quite important, but it doesn't automatically make your government uncorrupted and, you know, good and efficient. So perhaps articulating, you know, that in some way, what is your government? Rather than just simply emphasizing, oh, it's secular and period. You know, that's where the obnoxious aspect comes in. The assumption is that, oh, if you transform, as you should, again, I'm against sectarianism, but there was this assumption that when you transform from a sectarian system to a secular system, then, oh, your problems are just going to magically disappear because now you're modern. But as you know, that's not true. There will be corruption, there will be other problems, and you need a system, a good system that is representative of everyone, hmm. I think ultimately, and transparency and so many other checks and balances and components. Yeah. It's constant work. It's, it's constant work. Hope that Lebanon would move away from its sectarian form faded from the protest movement. Ambition seemed to reach ahead of ability. But divided or not, people were still on the streets and still demanding reforms. And on October 21st, when Prime Minister Saad Hariri's 72-hour time limit was up, he once again spoke to the nation. I gave a deadline to my partners in government so that urgent demands that date back two years would be implemented. These procedures have begun. Some of them are included in the budget, which we agreed on today, and some of them are not included. The reforms included a 2020 budget, a first for the country who hadn't had a budget in years. It targeted a deficit of 0.6% of GDP. It halved the salaries of lawmakers and ministers, eliminated some public bodies, and created a draft law to restore looted state money. And most importantly, no new taxes. But just as it was too late to save the Lebanese economy, this was too late to save Prime Minister Hariri. <laughs> I am going to Bab the palace to submit the government's resignation to President Michel Aoun and to the people in all areas in response to the will of many Lebanese who have taken to the streets to demand change. On October 29th, he submitted his resignation and the crowd celebrated. This was the downfall of a man who, to many, was emblematic of a corrupt regime that had swindled the people of their livelihoods and then their country. Protesters were now calling for the entire government to be thrown from office and the system replaced. But simultaneously, as the days stretched into weeks, the results became less tangible. Some lost interest, some could no longer afford to spend their days not working, while others began to drift back into their old groups. But um, what hit me hard most is that I believe that the, uh, the people that should be on the streets left the streets. Uh, I mean, like um, econo uh, the, the people who come from um, a less fortunate economical state. I mean, like the people who need to, to, uh, to talk about the financial issues and everything. So I felt like whenever I'm going down, we're the middle class, m more educated kind of people that, that are still on the streets. But the people that need to speak most left it at a certain point. And of course, this is kind of clear why it happens and how how like the politics works here in this aspect. But this was very sad because, OK, we do have our own demands, but the real demands come from from that um, from from that sect of people. Most Lebanese belong to political sects, but when, when it comes to um, poor communities or to marginalized communities, it happens that they are more affected or they are more connected to the political orders. And yes, because there were orders after all, like the political scenery changed and political parties started withdrawing and things changed on the political level. 
I think for most people that optimism uh, got crushed, whether, and let's say first and foremost, by the actions of uh, the regime, or the regimes with, a pl- with an S plural here, whether it was physical repression through the police or the military or the militias or thugs, and all of them were doing it from Mustaqbal to Hezbollah, Amal to uh, Aoun's party. Uh, so there's that component. There is the failure of the mainstream media and its representation and the vilification. There is also the failures of the organizers themselves to really build on the momentum that was being there to win more people on the ground beyond the Beirut bubble. And then you had sheer economics and then difficulties there. Then you had the pandemic that started that is, you know, quite intense. When COVID-19 emerged in Lebanon and the country went into lockdown, it put an end to protests on the street. The protesters had made their initial gains, but Lebanon's political machine would not give up that easily. Once an uphill battle, the struggle to create change soon became almost an impossibility. Feelings are feelings, and governing uh, structures in this country don't really take into account an average person's feelings. The reality is Lebanese do not control the basics of this country. They control the cosmetics. But if you want a country to actually determine its destiny, it has to emerge from its civil war once and for all. That hasn't happened. There is a huge issue that precedes 1990. It begins in the 1970s, and it has turned into something which is so well honed and so well funded and does not help anyone in this country, let alone the crowd that it claims to best represent, resent it. And it could be something that is extremely unpopular, yet it still functions the way it does. But Lebanon's prime minister would not be the only thing that fell in its revolution. As the people flooded the streets, the country's economy and banking system were detonating in slow motion. The people knew that the economy was bad. The country's cycles of booms and busts spoke to that all too well. The fuse to the most recent bust had been lit years prior. We were living in a country that has a lot of ups and downs regarding politics, regarding economy, regarding social life. It wasn't an easy life. However, we were actually able to at least live to go to work, to live normally, to find gas, to find food, to find uh, bread. My name is Dina Abuzor. Dina is a lawyer with Lebanon's Depositors Union. Since the collapse, she spent most of her time fighting with the country's banks. The banks who, it would turn out, had been hiding a big secret that was about to come out. The banking system here in Lebanon was actually called one of the best banking systems in the world. Apparently, it was one of the best banking systems in the world because it wasn't actually ruled by proper regulations and rules. So there was a huge margin or range of fleeing from accountability or actually not holding those accountable or money laundering or whatever other uh, like crimes or monetary crimes. It was easy for people to go through the system and actually do whatever they want. The moment that the bubble popped, things quickly and dramatically spiraled out of control. For years, Lebanon's central bank, or the BDL, headed by Governor Riyad Salame, had been running a Ponzi scheme. In 2015, Lebanon's central bank began to offer irresistibly high interest rates for people depositing dollars into the bank, and even higher interest rates for those depositing in Lebanese lira. To then pay these creditors their interest, the country was borrowing vast amounts of money, for those benefiting from these high interest rates, Riyad Salame could do no wrong. One of the reasons that we were living in a bubble was the very good image of this banking system we have. Because uh, our governor was taking awards all over the world, and apparently he was benefiting from those Ponzi schemes that he actually designed in collaboration with banks and politi- politicians. Because banks actually here in Lebanon, many of those banks were actually owned or uh, have shareholders from political, uh, from the political set. So we, you can actually imagine how their interests collide with each other. So it wasn't uh, as it was pictured. 
the banks were actually benefiting from what BDL was uh, was uh, offering. BDL was offering the government uh, grants and loans in order for it to actually continue. Uh, however, the banks knew that they were actually investing in this I don't want to say bankrupt country, however, in this not very good functioning country. So they actually knew and take the risk and benefited from high interests they were actually getting from BDL. So this scheme was very good, was very uh, good structured. So people actually thought that it would never reach what it did. And I believe that the accumulations of what was going on uh, from 2015, from the beginning of the Ponzi schemes and all those designs that the governor was actually trying to do, is what led Lebanon to what we, where, we, where it is right now. A central bank of a state running a Ponzi scheme is an ill-advised financial strategy. But the scale of the scheme engineered by central bank governor Riyad Salame made his bad financial strategy a fatal one. The Ponzi scheme was actually made between three main elements, the BDL, Banque du Liban, and the banks, and the politicians, because they all knew, they all knew that they were actually breaching the monetary law, and they actually continued doing so. They never thought about not doing it anymore. And if you ask any good economists in 2017, you actually can get answers regarding that they were foreseeing this crisis. They never thought it would, it would be this harsh. However, they were foreseeing it. Yani. When we reached the October 2019, things were too dark. There were no going back. Traditionally, when a Ponzi scheme collapses, the investor loses their money, while the individual at the top has the opportunity to run off with the funds, generally while trying to avoid being caught by the authorities. But in the case of Lebanon, it was the authorities running the Ponzi scheme, so there was no need for running. And rest assured, no one would be caught. Despite losses estimated at $69 billion, Riyadh Salame has not lost his job. Instead, the country's small depositors have been left holding the bill. They actually transferred their money outside of Lebanon and kept those depositors, the Lebanese depositors, trapped uh, here in Lebanon and their money trapped in bank. They actually got us, the Lebanese people and depositors, as hostages now. Not only our money, also the Lebanese people are hostages here in the country. In the days immediately following the collapse of the Lebanese financial system, billions of dollars were reported to have been transferred out of the country. The country's elite were making off with their money before anyone could figure out what had happened. One financial expert put the figure spirited away from the country at $9.5 billion. When the Pandora Papers, a trove of offshore financial documents, were leaked in 2021, some of Lebanon's highest profile individuals were found to have established numerous companies and tax havens, including Central Bank Governor Riyad Salame, former cabinet member and head of Al Mawarid Bank Marwan Khairuddin, Prime Minister Makati, and former Prime Minister Hassan Diab. All those accused have denied any wrongdoing. The bottom finally fell out of the Lebanese system in October 2019. Lebanon was now the third most indebted country in the world after Japan and Greece, with a debt-to-GDP ratio of 152%. Seeking to prevent a run on the banks, accounts were frozen and depositors lost access to their savings. Those accounts would never be unfrozen. One month later, the black market exchange rate for the dollar against the lira had risen from 1,500 to 2,000. By the end of December, one dollar would be traded for 8,350 lira. The money held by Lebanese citizens in the bank was not only inaccessible, but also quickly shrinking in value. The quicker the value of the Lebanese lira fell, the greater the anger of the Lebanese depositors. A fair proportion of this anger was directed at Riyad Salame, once seen as the miracle worker of the Lebanese financial market, and now the author of its demise. He is one of the most hated men here in Lebanon right now. He is the master of the central bank. Even though there is many committees back in the central bank, there are uh, many committees He can actually manage those committees, and he is the president of many of those committees. So it's surreal in a place. You can't actually ask him what he's doing or how he's trying to manage the central bank. Uh, You can only get uh, circulars, you can only get the 
regulations he actually sets. So uh, Riyad Salemi has been a governor for quite some time, يعني, he, almost 30 years. So uh, he actually knows everything about the Lebanese banking system and the central bank, how it actually works, how it actually can benefit him and his partners regarding politicians and the bankers. So he was trying to do his best in order to show that he was leading a, a, a super successful banking system. However, it wasn't the case. The governor actually was one of the maestros of this crisis. So we believe that he should be held accountable for all what we're going through, and especially for the three years that people lost their money. Uh... Lebanon took to the street in October 2019 demanding change. And change it got, just not the type it wanted. High-minded ideals about accountability, national unity, and an end to the corruption which has plagued the country since its inception fell by the wayside. Instead, sectarian divisions were reinforced and the depth of the country's financial troubles were unveiled. Lebanon's revolution would be put to the side for the time being, as it would soon have to grapple with a series of almost unimaginable crises. On the next episode, Beirut explodes. This episode of The New Arab Voice was written by me, Will Christou, and Hugo Goodrich. It was produced by Hugo Goodrich. Our theme music was by Omar Alfil. The New Arab Voice will be back next week. Until then, you can find all of our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram page and Twitter account, both at The New Arab Voice, for additional content. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode, and you can also rate and review, which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow The New Arab on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest news from the region.